Good day, everyone. Some of you already spent the morning with us, others just joined. Uh, whatever it is, thank you for being here at the Falling Walls Breakthrough Conversations. It's a special format. It's a chance for in-depth conversations with some of the leading scientists of today. Um, I'm Alina Schadwinkel, Managing Editor online for Spektrum der Wissenschaft. Um, I'll be your moderator for the next 15 to 20 minutes. And um, I'm ready to ask some questions about genome sequencing. You are encouraged to actively participate in this talk. If you do have a question you'd like to address to our guest, please just use the raise your hand option in Zoom and my colleagues will let me know that there is a question out to ask. Um, I will fit it in the conversation as soon as I can and I will try to fit in as many as possible within the time given. Um, if there's anything struggling with tech, just let us know in the chat and my colleagues will also take care of that. Um, which brings me to my guest, Shankar Balasubramanian. Um, he is Herschel Smith Professor of Medicinal Chemistry at the University of Cambridge. And his pioneering work on nucleic acids includes the invention of Solexa sequencing. And that's a technique that made it possible to sequence genomes accurately, affordably and really, really fast fast. Shankar, thank you for being here with us today. A warm welcome. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. And the next minutes um, you will tell you will hear and you will tell us about nothing less than ultra fast genome sequencing. So Shankar, what does the method you and your team develop make so special? In our cells, we have a copy of the genome, and the genome is made up of about three billion letters of information organized in a particular sequence. And these letters comprise the information that instructs our cells to, to build, ultimately, a living organism. So it's fundamentally important information. And the project that uh, I and colleagues started some 25 years ago was to create a method to read this code much faster than the methods of the day. And uh, the big international human genome project um, gave us the first reference sequence of one um, human genome. Now, this was an effort that took um, 10 years. It cost billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Thousands of people were involved. But of course, to, we all have a different genome. We all have a genome that's unique to us. So what was needed was a method that could decode genomes on a population scale. And that's, that's what we started work on. So why exactly is it important to decipher the genome? Why do I need this information for? Well, um, from a fundamental perspective, um, all living systems carry this information in the form of a genome. So um, from a perspective of studying and understanding life, um, sequencing the genome of every organism that exists gives you a blueprint of the code for that organism. So it's important from a fundamental perspective. With, with humans, um, you know, one of the big holy grails is to understand what it is that makes us who we are and what it is that makes us unique and different from each other. Again, a fundamental aspiration. Now, in terms of medicine, of course, um, our genomes can predispose us to certain diseases. And in fact, many diseases are genetic in origin. So the usefulness of reading this code is therein lies information that can be helpful for predicting uh, the onset of disease, detecting the onset of certain diseases, and understanding what um, therapies might be available or might need to be developed to treat these diseases. I would like to get back to that a bit later. Um, as you mentioned, the Human Genome Project, um, 
it's been a while that the first genome was published, at least that's what they called it. And I really remember that because that's what got me into science journalism, to be honest. I remember there was one, a newspaper who printed, which printed the full, well, tried to take as much of the sequence as possible on their, um, on the cover. And um, it struck me, you know, you just have these uh, four letters and that's us in some way. That's so astonishing. And there's so much, there are so many stories in these four letters. So you can write with these four letters. Um, that's my view. What excites you about it? Is it the same thing? Or what do you see when you look at a genome? Well, um, I'm a chemist and I, I look at molecules. And um, I've spent 30 years studying the DNA molecule. And for me, DNA is arguably the, the ultimate information molecule. It actually carries many different layers of information. The genetics, the sequence of the four letters is one layer of information. There are other layers of information that you can read from DNA as well. So what fascinates me uh, as a scientist really is uh, you have this information carrying molecule that somehow is the basis for all living things. Um, so uh, to, to try and understand how you go from molecular structure to information and then function and characteristics, um, I think is, uh, is a holy grail. And it's also something that's not understood in detail, right? There are a lot of questions that still remain to be answered. T today, um, we are still learning new things about DNA uh, that we, we never used to know and how it affects the characteristics of cells and living systems. So, uh, you know, it's, it's more than 70 years since the double helix structure, Franklin, Watson and Crick's work um, led to the creation of and understanding of. Um, but since then, there have been decades of continuous further discovery about um, DNA and what, what it might tell us about living systems. And I think there's much more to be understood. What's the biggest question for you at the moment? The most pressing one, maybe? Well, I think, um, you know, part of our genome is the part that codes for proteins. So these are genes, um, small segments. And, and this represents a little over 1% of the genome. So the other nearly 99% of the genome uh, we call non-coding mm -hmm. DNA. And um, some time back, um, some people would dismiss this as junk or useless DNA that's just packaging. It turns out that um, a lot of this non-coding DNA is actually active, active in the sense that um, if you remove it, you make changes to the characteristics of the organism. It's also active in that uh, much of it is converted to RNA by a process called transcription. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems that a lot of the genome is somehow involved in controlling that 1% that encodes for protein. So a very, very sophisticated um, architecture that regulates the expression of genes and the generation of proteins. Um, and I think we're, we're just starting to unravel the details of this. And how does your technique help to do so? Well, um, the, the technique that uh, I helped develop um, allows you to rapidly sequence large quantities of, of, of DNA. Now, um, there are many research-based techniques that now derive different types of information by, by sequencing. So for example, um, you can find out where proteins that control genes bind um, by a technique called ChIP-seq. You can find out uh, how much RNA is being generated by different parts of the genome by a technique called RNA-seq. There are methods for detecting um, the sort of three-dimensional structure. DNA is like spaghetti. It's, it's, it's looped, it's folded. And it turns out that this allows some parts of the DNA to come into close contact with other parts, 
leading to uh, alterations in how genes are switched on or switched off and, and conferring different cell states. So many techniques have been developed by molecular biologists that ultimately use reading DNA sequence as a readout to give other dimensions of information. Um, so the, the technique has been used much more broadly than just sequencing genomes, in fact. Oh, thank you. Um, we said that it's quicker, more affordable, at the, the technique uh, your team and you um, developed. Um, and I don't want to get too much into advertising, but could you uh, give us an, a comparison, like on a time scale, how much time do you save and why is it important that it works that quickly? Well, um, to give you a perspective, um, so the original Human Genome Project, uh, at that time, an instrument, a system of that day would sequence less than a million bases of DNA per experiment. Um, today's high-end systems, and these are commercial systems sold by Illumina, they will sequence trillions of bases of DNA um, per experiment. And, and this is the equivalent of sequencing a, a human genome at high depth every hour. So it, it means large-scale projects are now possible that were previously not possible. And examples of such projects are population-scale human genome sequencing, um, many of which are actually carried out um, in a way that's linked with healthcare systems in the States. So in the, in the UK, we, we have an effort called Genomics England that's linked to the National Health Service, where hundreds of thousands of genomes of patients have been sequenced affordably and also on a time scale that's relatively rapid turnaround. So I think cost and speed make certain things possible. Um, also, I think looking to the future, the, the cost of sequencing a genome is, is coming down to of the order of $100. Per genome. Per genome. Okay. And uh, this is now the cost of, it's approaching the cost of, of many simple diagnostic tests. So uh, it becomes possible now to incorporate whole human genome sequencing as a routine part of healthcare and medicine. So thank you for bringing up the uh, work in the UK, um, because uh, until now we talked about single genomes being sequenced. But if we want to think it or see it in a bigger picture, that it's important to understand how DNA works, how proteins are built and so on, how the body functions or maybe misfunctions in certain ways. Um, you do not need one genome, but you need a lot to actually figure out by what rules something works or maybe doesn't. Um, so how many, well, can, can you actually give a number? How many genomes have you uh, read so far? Well, I, I think the, the total number of human genome equivalents mm -hmm. that have been sequenced on the planet probably exceeds a million now. Because mm -hmm. um, projects such as the, uh, the UK Genomics England project are well over 100,000 genomes was a few years ago. So it's, these projects are of the order of hundreds of thousands of genomes. Mm -hmm. Similarly, um, many other countries have projects aiming to sequence um, a decent representative portion of the population. So it is running into millions now. And of course, because we're all intrinsically different and have mm -hmm. a unique genome, it takes a lot of information gathering to understand the genetic basis of predispositions to disease um, or, or, and, and indeed sort of complex diseases. Um, and a lot of cancers turn out to be quite complex mm -hmm. in terms of patterns of mutations um, that are driving the uh, disease state. So how important is it to actually um, mix and match these different sequencing platforms and the results they have. Because um, you just said everybody is an individual and the genome is individually and it's different. Um, but we need to check for overlays, right? And obviously we shouldn't do that only in Germany or in the UK or 
whatever other country outside of Europe, um, at least I think so, it would make sense to have a global comparison available. I think it's a, you make a, an excellent point, uh, not least of all, um, our genomes differ based on ethnicity. So um, I had my genome sequenced quite a few years ago, and when it was analyzed, they said there are a lot of SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphism, more than usual. Now, my roots are uh, Indian, but the reference genome was of a sort of European Caucasian white genome. So a lot of these differences were actually uh, genetic differences due to my particular ethnicity. So in, in order to really get at what it is that's contributing to disease states, we, we need to um, have lots of genomes across the global population that represents the people of the world. Absolutely right. Um. You are also interested in how DNA structures relate to cancer. Um, you mentioned that. Um, and there's a thing called G quadruplexus um, that might be important for that. This term always comes up when someone looks up your work. <laughs> At least I stumbled <laughs> across this several times. So maybe first you can give us a definition of um, what that is and then tell us how you think, um, wh why you think it's important in, um, in the cold cancer research department. Sure. Well, um, most of its time, DNA is structured as a double helix, two strands of DNA interwound together. Um, we've been working in my lab for over 20 years on a four-stranded quadruple helix structure, which we call the G quadruplex. And this structure can form from certain sequences of DNA that have a lot of Gs. Mm -hmm. And what, what we've observed is that these structures form in the part of the genome in cells um, that is normally associated with controlling genes. So we, we, our hypothesis is that they regulate the function of genes somehow. And we have seen in cancers uh, that cells have a very large number of these structures compared to normal cell states. And they seem to be associated with genes that are driving the cancers. So there is, there is a strong cancer connection. We're still trying to unpick the details of the mechanism of how they cause um, certain shifts in characteristics of cells, but there, there appears to be a strong cancer link. That sounds fascinating. It also sounds like it's still groundwork where you're working on and that it will take a while until it um, applies in clinical trials. Did I get that right? Um, I, I think um, there, there are two ways uh, this sort of research might make a, a useful difference in the future. One is in detection and diagnosis, and I think that's something for the mm -hmm. future. Um, the, the other is actually um, therapeutic molecules. Structures can often be targeted by potentially therapeutic molecules to intervene with function. And I think these are two directions for the future, but there is more work to be done. And I'm sure that you will contribute to that. Thank you so much for your answers, for your time. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm saying this because our time is already up. Um, it's been a pleasure to me. Thank you for being here. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Alina. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, now it's time for a short break again. Um, and you may stay on Zoom uh, to meet our next guests. It's two designers and scientists shifting notions of nature and technology. I'm looking forward to that talk. I enjoyed this one very much. Again, thank you so much for being here with us. Have a good day to everyone who's leaving now.